The Senator from Virginia, Senator Kane. Mr. President, I'm so glad to be with my colleagues on the floor on this most important day discussing a most important topic. And I want to say particularly I'm glad to follow my friend from Texas. The senior senator of Texas is a friend. We have traveled together. We have legislated together. But friends can disagree, and on this topic, we disagree strongly. Life throws ironies at us. The senator from Texas inhabits the seat that was held by Lyndon Baines Johnson. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the towering figure who helped usher through the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I inhabit a seat that for years was called the bird seat in the Senate. Inhabited for 50 years by Harry Byrd Sr. and Harry Byrd Jr., who were known for their virulent efforts to deprive African Americans of civil rights, including frequent extended filibusters on this floor against voting rights. LBJ is held in high regard today because of his passion for voting rights. Harry Byrd. I was at the state capitol in Richmond on Saturday to see our new governor inaugurated, and I walked by the spot on the capitol grounds where a Harry Bird statue used to stand. It was removed six months ago. The Harry Bird Middle School in Henrico County was renamed five years ago to the Cuyacuson Middle School. The Harry Bird Junior School of Business at the Shenandoah University in Winchester, their hometown, had that name stripped off the building a few years ago, and I stand to follow the senator who holds LBJ's seat, the senator from the bird seat, to today argue that the time has come for us to protect voting rights. I'm just happy to be on the floor talking about a bill. <laughs> I mean, for gosh sake, we've been able to talk about voting rights in morning hour. Mr. Leader, I've been here since January of 2013. This is the first time since then that we have been able to get a bill on the floor to talk about voting rights. And I'm going to admit something to you guys that will not surprise you because you know me. I am incredibly naive. <laughs> At age 63, I am still incredibly naive. I came to the Senate in 2013. One of the first things that happened was the Supreme Court of the United States struck down the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act in the Shelby versus Holder case. It happened when I'd been here about six months. And the Supreme Court said, but Congress can fix this. Preclearance is fine. You just shouldn't use a geographical requirement that dates back to 1965. Just come up with a new standard for which jurisdictions should have to preclear voting changes and make it even Stephen. And so we quickly did come up with something. You only have to get preclearance if you've had a history of voting rights problems in the last 10 years. If you don't, no preclearance. We'll treat every zip code, northwest, east, south, midwest, exactly the same. We came up with it, and we went to Republicans. And we went to Republicans knowing they were a great voting rights party. The 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, women's vote happened in a Democratic administration, but with Republican support. The 26th Amendment, 18-year-olds can vote, happened in the Nixon administration. But especially the Voting Rights Act, it wouldn't have happened without rock-solid Republican support. It was always reauthorized with Republican support. And so at this moment, when the act is gutted, we go to Republicans and say, all you have to do is be consistent with the history of your party and help us fix the Voting Rights Act. One, in the House, in the Senate. Where's this 150-year history of supporting voting rights? Only one, only the senior senator from Alaska, Senator Murkowski, would join in this effort. I was so naive. I was so naive. But we're here today, and we have an opportunity. Why are we here? We know why we're here. After preclearance was struck down, there began to be an escalating avalanche of laws to make it harder for people to vote. Then we had a president who did a frontal assault on democracy itself, demeaning the democracy, attacking election officials, trying to dig up dirt on a presidential opponent from a foreign country, 
refusing to concede, filing meritless lawsuits, bringing about threats against election officials, violence in the Capitol, against the Capitol, against these members, against the staffers, against Capitol Police, against our democracy, repeated efforts in states around the country to roll back, violent threats against election officials that persist even to today. That's why we're here. We are standing exactly in the same spot as that Senate stood in 1965. Disenfranchisement efforts coalesced by a galvanizing action of violence, the beating of John Lewis on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. We have an avalanche of disenfranchisement galvanized by an act of violence, the attack on this democracy, the physical attack on January 6th. The time to act is now. Let me respond quickly to some comments I've heard from colleagues this morning, particularly Senator Corn. And you've heard again and again this theme that the bills we are attempting is a federal takeover elections. They use that of federalizing elections, federal takeover of elections. And so here comes the history quiz part of my speech. <laughs> Both Senators Durbin and Klobuchar have referred to this and read it, but I'm going to do it again. The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. How many times, how many times in the Constitution can you read the phrase, at any time? The Constitution gives enormous powers to Congress in Article I, enormous powers to the President in Article II, powers to the judiciary in Article III, powers to states, powers to voters. It's sort of assumed when those powers are given, they can be exercised at any time. But in one occasion, in one occasion only, the framers decided we really better spell out at any time. The only use of that phrase in the Constitution is to put an exclamation point, essentially, after the notion that Congress must be able to act at any time to alter or state, to alter or make regulations with respect to federal vote. Senator Cornyn said that 94 percent of people were happy after Jan uh, the, the November 2020 elections. Then why has the GOP decided to systematically weaken vote, take votes away, put obstacles in the path, kick out duly sworn election officials and put decision making in other people's hands. Senator Cornyn said that this was a partisan effort. Partisan? Partisan? One of the chapters of our bill is nonpartisan redistricting. That's partisan. Another part of our bill is complete transparency in all campaign contributions. How is that partisan? Go poll any Republican, Democrat, independent populace about what they think of transparency of campaign contributions. It's overwhelmingly popular. We've made some of these changes in Virginia. Thank goodness that this bill would allow. And we just had a governor's race and turnout went up by 20 percent and a Republican won. When my candidate, it was good for democracy. This is not a partisan bill, even if the Republicans won't stand up for it. Finally, the Republican leader and Senator Cornyn started off with a lengthy, well, why won't you work on other stuff, like stuff about COVID, stuff about the economy? My memory's pretty good. I, I think we were here in March dealing with a significant bill it was about vaccinations and COVID and support for small businesses and, and, and a whole series of things, hospitals, educational aid. We were, and, and, and how many Republicans voted for that bill, the American Rescue Plan, you know, the one that was COVID and the economy? None. Yeah, why don't we pay attention to some other stuff? Well, we have been generally with little support. I'll close and say this. Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations, at any time. 
If not after the Supreme Court cuts the heart out of the Voting Rights Act, when? If not after an avalanche of state legislation carving back voting rights, when? If not after a violent attack unprecedented in the history of this country on the capital of the United States to disenfranchise 80 million people and disrupt the peaceful transfer of power, when? If not after subsequent big lies leading to action in state legislatures all over this country, when? We may act to protect federal elections at any time. We are here for such a time, and the time to act is now. Mr. President, I yield the floor.